It's the Kyle Hyman Show on Redeemer Radio. This is Kyle Hyman, and joining us to talk about a translation of the Gospel according to Mark. It's called The Memoirs of St. Peter. And joining us is the author, Michael Pakalik. Thanks for being here, Michael. Hey, Kyle. Hi. It's just great to be here. So you translated the Greek into English for this book. How many languages do you speak? Well, I don't speak any, well, English, I hope I speak okay. <laughs> Good. <laughs> but I've studied a lot of languages as a scholar, so reading knowledge, we say. But Greek, I, I read the Greek New Testament every single day and have for you know, a lot of years. Huh. And when I read something like Mark, it appears to me in a certain way. It has a certain kind of, I would say, liveliness, kind of immediacy, a sense of things taking place in present time that I think are lost in most translations, maybe even all other translations. So what I try to do in this translation is try to convey to someone who doesn't have Greek what it seems like to me when I'm reading the Gospel of Mark in Greek. Why do you think there is so many variations in translations, and why do you think these other translations don't have that same uh, feeling to them? Well, there's one kind of straightforward answer, and that's because the King James Bible has had tremendous influence in English language, so all translations are somehow starting from that translation, I think, and then hmm. you know, on a worldwide scale, the Vulgate of St. Jerome had tremendous influence. So hardly ever happens that anyone starts a translation afresh. Usually they're building on something else, and um, the language is, is pretty accepted. Also, there's a lot of paraphrase uh, Bibles, so if you get something that's both fresh and pretty literal, which mine is, it's not so easy to do. So you need to have someone who has a lot of experience in scholarly context, I think, rendering the Greek in a very accurate way, but also attuned to, so to speak, the spiritual significance of the language. So that's kind of the, the straightforward answer. The kind of more indirect answer is that this translation is based on a certain theory about the Gospel of Mark. So in the early Church, it was widely accepted that uh, St. Peter was of the kind of the narrator of what's contained in the Gospel of Mark. After all, Mark wasn't following Jesus in those early years. He wasn't an eyewitness. It reads like an eyewitness account. Where did the eyewitness details come from, right? Mm -hmm. And how did it have apostolic authority when Mark wasn't an apostle? So the early Church regarded as St. Peter's preaching taken down by Mark. It's with that idea, that thesis, that now you translate Let's try to bring out the sound of spoken language, of someone telling a story out loud as much as you can, while being very faithful and very accurate in the sense. And then also let's bring out details which suggest an eyewitness account. So make it as live and as immediate as you possibly can. Now, generally, it's kind of like you know, touching up a painting of the the nuances are very slight, but I think cumulatively they have a, a, a big effect, and people who have read this translation have said that. Hmm. You know, people use the language, I, I don't want to brag, but you know, people use the language game changer, thrilling, you know, electrifying. That was Brad Miner's review yesterday in the Catholic thing. So it does, it, I think it strikes a chord, and it seems to have been successful. It, it, it does what I wanted to do. Which I could understand those descriptors of something that was a paraphrase, if you were just saying, like, let me make this theatrical, you know, let, let me take this script and and turn it into a movie script. But if you're trying to stay accurate, why do you think it has those aspects to it, those characteristics? I think just very long practice, which I've had dealing with Aristotle and Plato of, for philosophical purposes, wanting to render Greek with utter precision and clarity and transparency, and then just applying that skill here. So why did you want to do St. Mark? Personal reasons. When I became a Christian in college, St. Mark was the first gospel that I studied, uh, kind of as a disciple, an early disciple, studying under a, a friend who went to Wheaton College at the time. And he's now a professor of scripture at Southern Methodist University. He ended up going on to Cambridge University in Duke, and he's a, a world-renowned scripture scholar. So how, how strange is that, that a couple of kids in, well, college, uh, you know, we're reading the Bible together, and, you know, I'm, I'm a well-known scholar, and he's a well-known scholar. Yeah, but not your typical started, college story. No, it all started in, in the living room of this folks' house, where we read the Gospel of Mark together, and had just such a deep impression on me. It's my first 
discipleship in Christianity that, you know, it's like falling in love. It's like courtship. You want to go back to that time and, and recapture it. So, you know, if you will, it's, you know, also the, look, Christianity is about knowing Christ and following Christ as a personal relationship with our Lord. So it's wanting to capture that excitement also at the same time, you know, not in a kind of crazy, enthusiastic way, but in a kind of responsible way as a, you know, mature man and a scholar, but trying to infuse the translation and the commentary that goes along with it with that same spirit, because that's what Christianity is all about. Yeah. We're talking with Michael Pakalik. The book is The Memoirs of St. Peter, a new translation of the gospel according to Mark. And what did you learn about the gospel through the process of doing your own translation of it? Well, so many different things. So probably like a lot of your listeners, I've read the Gospel of Mark a you know, hundred times in my life. Wow. But there are some things that, you know, I just began to notice strangely when you begin to write something like a commentary on the whole book. So one thing I think is very noteworthy about Mark is that it has a subjective story as well as an objective story. So the objective story is the story of our Lord. So he's a Nazareth, he's teaching, he works miracles, he comes down to Jerusalem, and against all expectation, he's betrayed and tortured and put to death, rejected by uh, the religious authorities and put to death. And that's, that's shocking. Right? So in the Gospel of Mark, that's a shocking turnaround, because at the beginning of the Gospel, he works great miracles. Mm-hmm. And, and, and it's clear that the author of the Gospel of Mark, I think it's underlying it, it's Peter, is just astounded at the wonders that he's seen by Lord, and that he could actually just be betrayed and abandoned and put to death is, is unbelievable. But that's the objective story. The subjective story is somebody who is also very near the beginning of this is appointed kind of the head of the apostles, and the apostles are given a kind of government over the church, and he's being instructed and going out two by two and how to preach and tested also in various ways, uh, in in fidelity and and loyalty, foolish debates about authority and who's the greatest among them and so on. Then at the very end, profession, even if everyone else falls away, I I never will, I'll I'll die if I have to. Hmm. Uh, But then what happens? A complete collapse, right? So the subjective story is the viewpoint of Peter, and it kind of mirrors our lords, and, but they, they both come down from this north country, from this provincial area into Jerusalem, and it's the big time of trial for Peter's friend, our lord. He's abandoned some, and Peter fails. He, he fails miserably. And that's kind of the end of the story from the point of view of Peter. I mean, it's interesting that if you look at the language, the narration of the passion is very matter-of-fact. It's just purely descriptive. Then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. It lacks that kind of sense of eyewitness participation that the earlier parts of the Gospel have. And, and why is that? Peter's, Peter's not there. Peter's, mm-hmm. Peter's left. Peter's abandoned our Lord. So that's one thing I saw, that kind of subjective. Another thing which is really interesting is that teaching uh, plays a, a much subdued role in the Gospel of Mark. So right away with Matthew, we have the Sermon on the Mount. Luke, we have the Sermon on the Plain. You know, people say Matthew is like a strata, has different, uh, you know, a little bit of episodes of miracles and then teaching and so on. It's like layers in, in Matthew and Mark. There's almost no teaching until the last third of the Gospel. And, and then what's interesting is that it's much more the miracles that is the, the, the subject of, of Mark's Gospel. And then when teaching is introduced, so what does our Lord talk about? He talks about marriage, marriage and divorce. He talks about welcoming children. That's very interesting if this is you know, coming from Peter's pastoral care. You know, right away, Peter's going to see that for the typical Christian, it's this fidelity in family life and welcoming Christ in family life is really going to be kind of the main matter of following our Lord. It's, so that's the main teaching that's put up at, up at front in, in the Gospel of Mark. So interesting. Do you have a favorite story from the book of Mark? Yeah, I really love the chapter where the three different types of showing mercy are so wonderfully interwoven. So Jesus goes across the Sea of Galilee to heal that Gerasen demoniac, Hmm. and then he comes back and he's on his way to helping Jairus' daughter when the woman with the hemorrhage interrupts. The three stories are just three 
in interesting ways, complementary ways of showing mercy for different types of human affliction. And so many different things are taught in that one combination of episodes. It's really just, it, it's a masterpiece. And you can just, you're just in awe looking at how that is told. It's really beautiful. So do you think you'll do more of these translations of other Gospels or other books of the Bible? Well, I've been told by my publisher they're, they're going into a second printing already. I mean, apparently this has you know, been hugely successful, even though it just went on, you know, it was launched today. This book. Yeah. So, if, you know, if, if there's a lot, if, isn't that great? That's amazing. So if it's a big, yeah, so if it's a huge success, as I hope, and, you know, not for my own good, but because, you know, this is it. This is the center of everything. This is the gospel, right? But then I'm going to do John, and I've kind of started on that already, because John is like the opposite of Mark. Mark is concrete detail and immediacy and and miracles. And John is spiritual and written at a distance and contemplative and philosophical. So it's like the opposite. The, the other three Gospels are called synoptic because they basically tell the story of our, our Lord's life in the same way. John is, is an outlier. And, you know, it kind of as a philosopher, I regard it as a challenge because it's very interesting and deep philosophically and theologically. But then also, with John, you have the same kind of question. You have phrases that people have heard a hundred times, like the prologue to the Gospel of John. And can you render that in a way, again, that's completely accurate, but which really makes people sit up and say, wow, this is really interesting what he's saying. Let me just say something about the commentary on on the Gospel of Mark. I think that, so there's a commentary that goes along with my translation, but we live in a time when people who preach sermons or homilies, I'm speaking from a Catholic context here more than anything else. Sure. You know, in Protestant churches, people bring out their Bibles and have like a study session during the sermon. But it's not unknown in Protestant churches as well that right away the pastor goes to a moral lesson drawn from the gospel, a psychological inference to be drawn. And what I'm really interested in is what happened. I'm interested in what has been called the literary sense. And you, know, you might think that's pretty obvious, what happened, but I think if you ask this question, what exactly happened and how did it happen, and you pursue what used to be called in management theory, the five whys, like why did this happen and then why did that happen and why mm. did this next thing happen? It's, first of all, it's intellectually very challenging. It's not straightforward at all. So my commentary tries to bring that out. But this is really a smart person is going to find it really interest, interesting to think about this. But then you also just, you know, it's just very incarnational, because it's in what happened. I think I made cite this in the introduction. When Flannery O'Connor was asked about the short story, she wrote, well, what are you saying in this story? She'd say something like, well, the story is what I'm trying to say. And it's like, don't reduce the richness and the interest of this concrete story to some kind of moralistic lesson or truism, right? It's much, much more interesting than that. Yeah. And I think that the the life of Christ is like that. Let's also grasp that, sure. Yeah, there are lots of important moral truths to learn from this and spiritual ideas and so on. But let's also think about what happened. That's pretty interesting, too. It is, after all, the incarnation, right? Yeah. Well, this is so fascinating, and I think there's a lot of people that want to get a copy of this. Obviously, you've sold so many already. Uh, where can people get a copy of the book? Well, Amazon will get restocked, so that's a, that's a safe place to get it. I think authors always say, ask for it at your, your local bookstore, because then the bookstore has to order it, and that helps whatever the ranking of your book. But, you know, Amazon is pretty easy, and they've sold out, but I've been told by the publisher that they're going to be replenished right away, so you'll get the book quickly. Don't worry, you won't have to wait a week to get it. All right, again, it's called The Memoirs of St. Peter, a new translation of the Gospel according to Mark. Michael Pakalik, thanks so much for joining us today and enlighten us on the Gospel of Mark. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Kyle.